Hey boys and girls, here we are at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show and I'm with uh, Thomas Mueller and uh, he and I are going to talk about something that I um, have wanted to have as part of our, our reports and part of my ability to figure out how things work. Thomas, Thomas's company actually can reverse engineer software. So what we're going to talk about today is a little different than what we normally talk about on Monroe Live, but I think you're going to find it very, very interesting. So Thomas, I, I welcome you. I'm so glad that, uh, that, uh, that we got introduced together. So uh, let's, let's Sandy, dive great in. To, great to touch base. And uh, obviously, I'm a, I'm a big admirer of what you guys are doing in terms of physical teardowns, analysis, the whole reverse engineering that you guys are doing. And uh, while I look at the end product itself, um, the, the passenger cars, but also the commercial vehicles, they become more and more defined through their abilities just by software. A car today is about 100 million lines of code on average. Yeah. That's a huge amount of software. That's more than a Dreamliner. It's 10 times what a Boeing Dreamliner is in terms of software. Yeah. And the, the big opportunity that we see is um, on, on how to help this industry to create a product that not only is relevant by the time that you buy the product, but actually stays relevant throughout the life cycle with you or subsequent owners. And people's abilities and, and capabilities with the products are changing. So how is that been done and how can this be you know, understood, engineered, reverse engineered in better shape than full? So one of the things that you've just touched on, um, so when I was at Ford Motor Company, I was, I was working in artificial intelligence. I worked on an expert system that um, in essence, we still use today. Ford kind of walked away from it, but we kept it going. And this is our way of figuring out how much everything costs inside of a car, how much uh, how much labor is involved, and yep. whether it's got ergonomic problems and whatnot. So we've developed that. But what we couldn't develop because we didn't move into um, a real a really good AI program was cognitive knowledge, the ability mm -hmm. for the for the software to look at a situation and say, well, I was told this, but this, the, the situation I've just been in, it makes it even better. It, it enhances my ability as the software to do a good job. Yeah. And when you talk about the types of stuff that, um, uh, that you're working on, I, uh, I got extremely interested because this is, this is what makes the better vehicle. Now, Tesla is doing some of this stuff, they download information from every car that's on the road. Yep. And when they do that, they figure out how to make a better product better every day. So, and that's kind of that's kind of where we are right now. <laughs> and here we're getting to the to the, to the core uh, of the opportunity. I would say, today, if you want to build a system that can learn from your usage, that understands your intent, you need a lot of computing horsepower, so to say to actually run these capabilities. We call it inferencing. And if you want to run inferencing for your neural models, eventually to train them, you need a lot of, let's say, hardware compute capabilities. Yeah. And these compute capabilities of certain, certainly come at a cost. And the today's most vehicles today have distributed their compute across literally 100 ECUs, electronic control units, throughout the vehicle. There's small ones yeah. that control your digital lighting. There is larger ones that control your infotainment system. But ultimately, it's a, it's a high two-digit figure, at least 50. The new Range Rover, for example, is 66 ECUs, and they brought it down from 150. Um, there's other vehicles out there that have certainly above 100 ECUs today that are just shipping. Yeah. So there's a lot of distributed systems, and they are all called embedded systems. They're very much confined in terms of capacity, storage, memory, and they're not scalable. So you cannot grow the software on these computers, essentially. Right. Yeah. And that, that is part of the problem. And the, the big change and opportunity you see is if we can separate the software from the hardware and we can consolidate the software on much larger pods, we call them HPCs, high performance computers, we can actually grow the software inside the vehicle and the next step is to connect it smartly through the existing connectivity solutions, 4G, 5G, eventually 6G, with infinite scalable compute outside the vehicle and create a system right. that can grow over a decade. And here's the deal. When you look at some of these discrete little, um, little units, these little ECUs, some of them are, let me rephrase that, 
the major reason that car companies don't want to move from where they are to where they should be is because these things are dedicated. They only know one thing, they can only do one thing, and their, their capacity for expansion is, is nil. So what I, I've had conversations with lots of different car manufacturers, and I bring up the same thing. Why do you have 150 boxes when you should have maybe 10 at the most? I mean, really and truly, why are we doing it? Well, it's more cost effective, it's bull. That is not more cost effective, that is definitely heavier. Yep. That definitely affects your, your efficiency. Wiring harnesses. Wiring harnesses are everywhere. Why? Because they have to. You have to go from this little teeny ECU to some other bigger box, to yep. some other bigger box, and then ultimately to some mechanical device that, or maybe electronic device that you either push on your, uh, on your screen or what have you. The, the ability, the ability to, for us to move from where we are with 150 little teeny boxes or 150 boxes, large and small, yeah. to where we should be with maybe 10, five, that's even more aggressive. But anyways, if we can get down to five, everybody should be half here. This would mean instantaneous. So there's a thing called latency. It's the biggest problem that everybody yes. has. Nobody, nobody uh, wants to address it because latency is the time the, the fraction of a second that it would take to go from here to there. Absolutely. And latency is one of the biggest killers of, um, of efficiency inside the vehicle, without a question of a doubt in my mind. Sandy, everybody who designed communication system knows every hop that your signal does across a router or a switch adds to that latency. Exactly. And we, we can live with a certain amount of latency in automotive engineering but it has to be guaranteed under any operational circumstances. So we need to understand the time difference between a signal that has been issued by a sensor or by an actuator yeah. and the time it always takes under any circumstance to react to it. And we call this a guaranteed maximum latency. Right. And systems that ensure across all of the operational state a guaranteed maximum latency, this is the platform basically for safety. And we need to, because we're dealing with different types of apps in a car. You can say right. there's apps that are entertaining. Let's say, think of Netflix or Prime Video that is on yeah. the rear seat entertainment or on the big cinema screens in a BMW. That is certainly not safety critical. But for example, the display of the speed to a driver, which gives him you know, situational awareness, yeah. that is safety critical. Right. Not as safety critical as hitting the brake pedal or moving a completely electronic steering system. So these are their stages in safety criticality. And what we need to build, and this is the collective, basically big elephant in the room, we're building systems that can guarantee that certain apps that are co-hosted on a big computer get their resources that they need under any operational circumstances. And even if one resource may fail, let's say the whole computer goes dark, that these resources are instantaneously being picked up by a backup system. Right, right. And the design of these backup systems, you've been doing the teardowns on, on the Tesla systems yeah. quite a lot. When you tear down their central cockpit computer and ADAS computer, you'll figure that the ADAS computer has two of their own silicons that That's they right. design. One is there for live operations and one is there for backup. Right. Now you can say that's wasteful. From a bomb perspective, it's wasteful to have a, a standby right. system just for redundancy. So the smart and very different move that nobody else in the industry so far has really been mimicking or adopting is Tesla started to use the standby chip, the SOC, in normal operations for performing value creation for them as a company because they basically run a second version of the autopilot software as they call it the ADA software as we yeah, say yeah, generally yeah. they run the same copy of it and that same copy analyzes your driving your operator exactly. of Tesla it's called shadow mode and this shadow mode is a very efficient way of helping Tesla to create better software like you mentioned before and this is the main difference. They're not just waste, wasting the resources for standby cases, which are unlike, but they can occur, but they're making actually productive use. And that's very similar to CIOs and their data centers using not just passive standby servers to back up a, a hot live server, but they're using the standby servers for testing and other purposes while still having the ability to switch over within a few milliseconds from a live system to a failover system. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that, um, these are the things that 
very few other car companies are doing. And the reason for that, I think, is because of compartmentalization. Absolutely. So this guy does this. Yes. I'm an HVAC person. Yep. I don't want to be involved with something that has to do with door latches. I do this. And as long as you've got that old fashioned engineering technique that, that um, yep. you know, I'm a such and such kind of engineer or, yep. or another, as long as you've got that compartmentalization, as long as you've got that, you can't get to an effective, efficient yep. system. You have to start thinking globally. And that's what I like about Tesla. Tesla's people, they just reach out and they say, hey, you know what? I've got extra capacity here on my, uh, on my cooling system and you don't have to have that box. So let's get rid of your box, put whatever you need in it. And, and by the way, I've got chips here that are underutilized. So what we can do is we can take the, the functions and features that you want out of there, put them in here and call it a day. Who's got, I mean, I don't want to get into the Dojo chip, but that chip, I mean, what, what is, what's the ultimate goal of that chip? Could it run the whole damn car all by itself? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day. Do Dojo is, it's just an extreme um, version of basically creating a super chip that yeah. allows you to reconcile, to use the reconciled information from your fleet and process the learning a lot quicker than using commercial off-the-shelf right. systems. So ultimately, Project Dojo came out of the frustration using run-of-the-mill accelerator cards, the likes of NVIDIA's and AMD yeah, accelerator yeah. cards, or Intel has them, yeah. to basically train neural models. So if you want to train them in a week, opposed to training them in 12 hours. So yeah. that was Tesla's use case for this waiver size chips that they created, which is basically a lot of IP put together on an entire waiver and put it into a rack-based system now and spun it up a system. It's an amazing engineering yeah. marvel. Yeah. However, they could have done this with off-the-shelf compute that you could get at the usual shows, but that's only one part of the equation. The other part of the equation at, at Tesla's was really to sync off a system that is in the vehicle and is able in real time to make a digestion between information that comes in from a camera signal or from a radar signal in earlier days and say, is this relevant for me to actually bring back to attention at my mothership level? Yeah. Or shall I leave that information and just drop it and discard it? And, and here's the, the difference approach. The Tesla, I call it the Tesla harvester, is extremely efficient. If you wire shock the connectivity connection between a Tesla and the information transmitted to Tesla's private cloud, you will figure out that after a two hour drive, a Tesla produces an, a stunningly low amount of data that is being extracted from the vehicle that is near, nowhere near close to the overall amount that comes in from the sensor stack. So Tesla, in other words, filters out the needle in a haystack right underneath the passenger seat where the ECU is allocated, the high performance computer. Yeah, yeah. Other car makers today are approaching this by collecting all of the signals from the radar, right. from the cameras, storing them, transmitting the bulk load to a central platform and then trying to figure out the needle in a haystack later on. That not only creates a lot of cost on cloud platforms, the likes of Google, Microsoft or AWS, it also delays the decision making to see what's relevant and not. Tesla's right. ability in real time to decide what's relevant or not is the big differentiator. Well, I think, I think some of that has to do with uh, a, a term I don't usually like to get into uh, uh, terminology that people don't understand, but edge computing just basically means that these two chips are right together and they, they don't, there is no latency, they're right there. And the more you can move toward that, the more you can sift through the needle and the haystack. These are the things that I think, um, I'm positive yeah. that's what we're going to be seeing and in the future. We call this edge AI capability. So the ability that the edge, in that case, we call the vehicle the far edge because there's also yeah. a cloud edge. Right, yeah. The vehicle itself as the far edge has enough horsepower in terms of compute to process the sheer amount of real-time signals, mainly from the camera sensors that come in, yeah. in real-time and digest what's relevant and whatnot. Tesla sensors are 1.8 megapixel sensors, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, NEO, you, as an example, on the EP7, uses already 8 megapixel sensors. The new Sony car that's been launched here at CES presumably goes above 10 megapixels per camera sensor. That is a, a huge amount of raw data that hits a computer that needs to be sipped through in real time to make these digestions. So you need enough horsepower to do this, and this horsepower 
is relevant for the product lifespan. So the product lifespan is 15 years, presumably, or 12 to 15 years. So how do you ensure that you have enough horsepower from day one to sip through this as the software that makes sense of this information also keeps growing? And this is where the disaggregation, we call this the disaggregation of the traditional distributed ECUs and the move to a centralized supercompute platform in a car, which is abstracted from the software itself, becomes so relevant to the industry. So when we speak about teardown analysis, we want to basically take those 150 ECU boxes, yeah. take the software out of them, take this software, transform it to a software that can be better maintained. Because it's like, I'm a mainframe guy. I grew up in my early days on an IBM mainframe. It had monolithic code. It was very hard to make changes to that because it had so many impacts. Right. Yeah. Today, the software in these ECUs is written exactly in the same way. It's monolithic spaghetti code. But if you want to transform it to smaller chunks, which can be maintained much easier, like Lego, small Lego bricks that mm -hmm. can be composed and decomposed easily, that is where the software gets refactored, gets, the software gets migrated, and can be landed on a platform similar to the likes of Amazon Cloud or Microsoft Cloud in a car. We call it a microservices platform. And this is where software engineers have a huge opportunity in making their life a lot easier. The other thing that I want to touch upon is, is all that software in a car, these 100 million lines of code today, are written in literally a single language. It's C, a 40-ish year old programming yeah. language um, developed in the, in the late 60s, in the early 70s. That software language is, is used across all car makers. It's very limiting to find people that are really good at it. It's very limiting in terms of security challenges. It's very slow in realizing new use cases. People cannot use modern coding techniques to write the software that is in the car, which is a limiting factor. Mm -hmm. So the approach that we're thinking is not just opening up and removing the software as is, but changing the software, <coughs> adding the ability to use other programming techniques that allow you to do things faster, more focused, safer, more yeah. secure yeah. from a cybersecurity standpoint. So we can use languages like Rust, and Go, uh, Java, WebAssembly, commonplace in cloud applications today, for the in-car software as well. And this is one of the, the opportunities that we see for car makers moving away from this monoculture, using one language, four decades old, to yeah. get features done. Right, so what I, what I was uh, really kind of um, surprised or interested or actually delighted to hear was that <clears throat> when you talked about uh, BMW moving away from... Um, A Linux uh, operating system. Yeah, yeah, Linux. I'm moving away from Linux and moving towards something new. I'm not sure what new it is, but C, C-based programs, like you say, um, so I went to school in those in those era, and we thought C was wonderful because yeah. I didn't have a bag of cards that I was using. And all of a sudden, software was really and truly software, not some, not a bunch of digitized cards that, that, that did what, what you thought they were going to do. Yeah. I, I think, I don't know how we, we've gotten to this point based on software that I took when I was in college. Yeah. What the, I mean, really and truly, think of it, that's ponderous. Yeah, that, it, uh, is. it is. And uh, I have to admit, I mean, the, the move that BMW, for example, I gave you that example, announced a departure in their software strategy for the cockpit part, so the visible part that basically is behind your in infotainment screens, is behind your driver displays, the passenger displays, the rear displays. And that departure basically from a Linux-based system, which is hard to retrofit all the advances from a consumer operating system. Yeah. Android has been become commonplace. It has so many integrated apps and features that just come with the free. system, the ecosystem for free, um, that it is really hard to retrofit this. I, I manifested this and when I looked at the BMW iX, for example, the route planning when it, the product was launched in 2021, the IX took a painful long time to calculate routes with charge yeah. points from, a, you know, uh, you do a route in Germany, for example. <clears throat> that was compared to a route planning in a Google-based system, in an Android, Google Automotive system-based system. It was taking a fraction of the time. And BMW, I believe, was struggling with keeping up with the ease of usability of some of those systems. Yeah. So they looked at alternatives, and I think there they made the decision to move to Android in the cockpit space relatively quickly, stunningly quickly for a big company that's been invested 20-ish years into uh, the cockpit space with their, you know, at, at the time, always class-leading technology. But they got into deeper, I think, more difficult waters at the time when OS 8 was launched with the curved displays yeah, that yeah. is now becoming commonplace across most of their products. But the usability issues came on top of that. And 
They, they're in similar challenges that Volkswagen Group has. Is they, they, Volkswagen has been you know, widely uh, criticized for some of the usability of their cockpit solutions. So they had to rethink a lot of that. And using a commonplace system uh, like Android mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Now the question is, from a software standpoint, how quickly can you replace a Linux system and the underlying embedded cockpit controller, the ECU, with an Android-based system? How many changes do you need to make? And this gets us back to the whole system architecture. How can you continuously separate the hardware from the software so that you can basically grow your software independently? Right, so for me anyway, uh, when you move from one language to the next, a lot of the chips can't keep up, they, yep. they're gone. So the first thing I, I've got to tell you is that, um, or t tell the viewing folks, is that occasionally a company has to, has to do a risk analysis. And the risk analysis for BMW, uh, I'm going to stick with BMW. I don't want to get into the VW yeah. story. Yeah. Uh, I'll get more hate mail. But, but the BMW risk assessment that was done said, you know what? This was good then, but we've got to go here now. And when you cut and run, when you decide, DECA is the key word there, DECA is to cut. <clears throat> That, when you make that decision to cut yourself off from any other option, in many cases, in most cases, it's the right thing to do. You look at it, you say, oh, this is going to be painful, I don't want to do it, and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But you know what? If you have cancer and something has to be removed, you have to make a decision. Yeah. What's going to get cut? Am I going to die young or am I going to lose the ability to uh, uh, have, have a prostrate or whatever. Yeah. Okay, that kind of stuff <clears throat> is the decision that BMW made. Now, I'm telling you, for me anyway, I believe that um, every car company, every car company is in the next two or three years going to have to make a great big giant decision. And that great big giant decision is going to be, do we uh, try and figure out, <clears throat> excuse me, do we try and figure out how we're going to do this on our own? Or are we going to figure out how to use something that's in the marketplace that has tens of thousands of people basically working on their products? Are Absolutely. we going to do that? And if we do that, how many of these smaller chip companies are we going to leave in the dust? I totally agree, Sandy. Yeah. I've, been, I've been baffled. When I looked into the automotive industry starting around 2019, and I'm a, I'm a software engineer and architect across many industries, but I looked into automotive and I found that the use of standard software in this industry is extremely limited. Think right. of it like if you want a financial services system today to run your companies and HR systems, you're not going to write this yourself. Uh, you're going to use something from SAP, Oracle, and others right. in the market right. in there. But this reminds me here uh, of a situation in the late 80s when we didn't have such standard software in automotive. So now we're seeing the opportunity. A lot of the software that we need to build for cars are coming as standard software building blocks. Middleware is a great example. Yeah. There yeah. is today middleware available from great partners that you can use to plug in as a safety middleware that does all the functions for you instead of your teams with hundreds of engineers developing all by themselves. And we know the pride of engineers. They want to you know, build things well, usually themselves instead of adopting things. Right. It's a bit of ingrained in the engineer mentality, but we see that a lot of the horsepower and work on the engineering side is spent on creating things that are available as off the shelf configurable solutions instead of you know growing it everyone in his own company right so. and and so what you get down to is a psychological problem and engineers are geared designed trained to do what our job as an engineer is to is to try and create mathematical mathematical solutions not come up with emotional decisions and when somebody comes along and says oh we have to keep our software engineers and it's something that I can buy off the shelf. I ask the question, well, why is that? What's the reason? Well, we need to have that internal uh, capability. Are you exactly. sure? Are you really sure? And, and can, you, can you tell me why you're doing that? Well, we have to do that because we're using these cheap components, the 150 yep. ECUs that we were talking about. We have to use these cheap components here. Wait a minute. We're, we're killing, we're killing our, our ability to be an advanced corporation, we're slowing latency down, 
we're making it more inefficient and we're doing all so we can save a half a penny on on this thing over are you kidding me and when like i say i really have to applaud bmw <clears throat> for their uh, their decision their cut and run decision that says you know, we went that way before, but not anymore. And it stays a BMW. It feels like a BMW. It is the user experience that they have. But now with the new system that will presumably come sometime this year, they have the ability to adopt features that come from the market a lot quicker than in the old architecture that they were trapped in, right. basically. And then that's what I really have to give them, you know, brownie yeah. points for. I think it's a, it's a wise decision. Yeah. It's, in, it's in line with other industry players. Renault had um, announced basically a few months back in November that they were partnering with Google to build basically a smartphone-like architecture for cars. Right. And that investment that basically Renault and Google are doing together will lead to the ability that not only non-safety critical apps, but actually apps that are safety critically come to this place. And think, I'll give you one example. Uh, on BMW, some people look at their cockpits and say, well, I would like to have the ability to have more skins that make my cockpit look differently. So today, OEMs give you limited choices. Sometimes they often just, just change the colors. Yeah, change the Merce colors. Mercedes, yeah, yeah. MB, yeah. OUX, you can change a few of the styles. Yeah. In BMW, you're stuck with a certain layout that they prescribe. It has to do with safety as well, because the speed display is a guaranteed safety critical application. So with other warning lights, like your ESP failing and others. So in the future, what we're looking at is a download capability for safety critical apps from an app store. So third parties, others can create skins as an example, which will change the way that your product feels. Android users love their products exactly for that yeah. because you can customize Android a lot without compromising on the usability. And that will- Or the speed. Or the speed. And that, that will happen in the future for cars as well. We're going one step further, and I know this sounds perhaps a bit futuristic, but think of you buying a car and you like the hardware of it. You like the haptics, the powertrain, how it feels. But you perhaps do not like their software as it, for example, actuates the car under assisted driving. So you may say, I buy a, a hardware from an OEM, say brand A, but I like the software that does the, let's say the, the highway pilot or the urban pilot function from another vendor. That could be an OEM, that could be a third party. Today, it's unthinkable that you could download software that actuates your car from an app store. But in the future, we believe that that capability will come in. And this is, this is all down to changing the way hardware software work together exactly. as a rationalized system. So this is why the separation that we spoke about at the beginning becomes so relevant to the industry. And the speed of transforming applications from the classical spaghetti code architecture that was used in the industry for 20 plus years to a modern, call it cloud native architecture, yeah. becomes so imperative. Well, I, I think that we're at some sort of a critical stage where um, not just BMW, but everybody is going to have to make that yeah. giant decision. That, that decision is going to be very tough on some of the um, dyed in the wool uh, companies. And like I said, I'm not going to drift into uh, what I would classify the, the, the three biggest and uh, the, the three most vulnerable com companies out there. But I'm telling you, there are three very vulnerable com companies that are still hoping that somehow they're going to buy componentry that will save their way into prosperity, and it ain't gonna work. Yeah. It never worked, it never will work. I, I don't know why anybody would waste their time on yeah. it. But I think that coming up, like you said, I, I was asked to, uh, uh, give something on the future. And I said that in the future, you'll have a car, if you have an electric car, they really don't wear out. You're not gonna wear out the electric motor. Yeah. The gear train is way over designed, it'll yeah. never wear out. Yeah. The, uh, the brakes, they don't wear out because you're using regen cool. all yeah, the time. Regen bracing. Yeah. You, your tires don't even wear out. <coughs> and then when you look at the safety issues, as, the, as everyone's seen it, that I just found out that the guy did it on purpose, but he, ran off the expressway, went 250 feet square down into a canyon, smashed the daylights out of the car, everybody's alive. <clears throat> that Model, I think he was in a Model Y, that Model Y saved her. There's no way in the world I would ever expect that to happen, <coughs> excuse me, in any other vehicle. I think that coming up, the vehicles are gonna last like forever. 
If you've got a good vehicle, if you happen to have something like a Tesla, and even some of the other ones, like I've, I've got a lot of, I've said a lot of good things about the F-150 Lightning. Yeah. I think without a question of a doubt, that is the best pickup truck in the marketplace today. I don't know who's going to kick them out, but I'm sure it ain't going to be uh, the Chevy Blazer. That thing is phenomenally good. That truck will last forever. But really and truly, the software will get old. So now, yeah. the, when I was asked by these other people on the phone, well, what do I think is going to happen? I, I said, I think that there'll be upgrades and updates. <clears throat> but as time goes by, people will come up with apps. You download the app. The app goes into your uh, system. The app says, well, e that really doesn't work anymore. Somehow it pulls out what was old, puts in what was new, and suddenly you have the ability to change the configuration on your instrument panel or or change the ride characteristics completely. Absolutely. Yeah. And one, one of the things is it's all about, we call it life cycle management. Your yeah. ability to continuously, let it be, hundred times a year, can it be a thousand times a year, upgrade your software. If yeah. you look at services like Netflix, Netflix or Microsoft Teams, they're updating multiple times a day their software. It's a rolling update. Verizon, at and all of their networks, critical infrastructure, are updating as a continuous basis. Multiple times a week are being cell sites being updated right. on a continuous basis without losing service. So this is the ability that we get to in a new ways of working with software. And down to your point about benchmarking, I want to make that point. When it comes to cost, think of one dollar R&D that gets into a feature development. Say you want a new feature. I'll give you an example. I, I hear that every year here in the US about 50 young children are dying in cars as the hot car child right, symptom. Yeah, right. And today we would be easily in a position to create a function that prevents that. If we put together the different sensors and the connectivity abilities in a car to create an app that mitigates that. An app that warns whoever is the owner, driver, etc. Right. But to create that software in the traditional distributed way is a huge exercise to do because you have to make changes to so many ECUs that need to work together that it becomes really a complex thing to do. Right. In the future, our ability is that you could create such an app within a few weeks and have it as a software job delivered to right. a product to prevent such functions. Yes. Whatever you want to orchestrate this with. And the R&D dollar today, if you look at $1 spent on R&D in traditional auto engineering, I can guarantee you that between 50 and 55% go into what we call overhead, quality yeah, assurance right, yeah. and override management. So it's a devaluation of your R&D dollar. And in other industries where we work to the modern principles of microservices, service oriented architecture principles, this devaluation is not 50 or 55%, it's more like 35, 30 to 35%. So there is the gain overall that every R&D dollar for a feature, for a storyline that someone wants you to implement, yeah. gets 20 to 30, 25% um, you know, less costly. And this is huge because R&D budgets are limited. Business owners can spend so much yeah. on new features that they want to have. So you get a lot more software output, a lot more features implemented. And you do it in, effective, in an effective, efficient way. Because when you start looking at the guys that are making software for Let's, I don't want to use the cloud exactly, but I can't think of anything else. When you're looking at this, these guys have got this kind of breadth that they, that they have to continue yeah. uh, to, to uh, keep up to date on. Yeah. But the guy that's doing a car is looking at this, yeah. and, it, and that's the whole of the engineering group, but then it gets smaller as you move down to division divisions. So let's get back to the, the, uh, the tragedy associated with kids in cars. The kid is in the car, and I know it because he's sitting or you she's sitting in a monitoring seat. monitoring solution, you have a... I don't even need that. Yeah. I, it's already right there. Yeah. I yeah, know that there's a kid in the car. I know that there's nobody in the driver's seat. Yeah. I know that, uh, that, that it's getting hot in the car. Yeah. You have a full set of sensor information. And I also know, well, many people uh, uh, have their cell phone linked to their car because or you know uh, sims, you know and you know what this should go away tomorrow and again when i was talking to these uh, people that were looking at the future i said the same thing this should this is a travesty this should go away tomorrow but it won't because the guy that does the seats doesn't do the controller on the inside of the uh 
on the inside of the uh, uh, the car temperature. Yeah. He doesn't he doesn't have an interface with the um, HVAC the HVAC system or the door locking or door whatever. Locking. But, yeah. but I'm just talking about is uh, is the um, what do you call it? Uh, the connection between your cell phone and the car yeah. when you want to, when you when you're getting voice commands and stuff like yeah. that. He doesn't have that ability. That he's in his division. This guy's. This is a stupid, old-fashioned and there's, micro, and mean, there's so many applications and use cases yeah. that cut across all the vehicle domains where it is yeah. extremely complex to orchestrate this. And this is why with the disaggregation, the teardown of software, the separation, we can move to a system that can be maintained by the OEM and by third parties in their respective areas without needing to do the full you know, regression testing. When you make a change today, we do we typically, we as a service provider often do for our car makers the full regression testing, like right, running yeah, ten thousands yeah. of tests when one software change is made. In other industries like Netflix, when they make a change to a component, they only test the five or 10 use cases linked to that microservice as a component. So their testing is a fraction right. of the typical testing that car makers are doing today. This is where the efficiency comes from and change right. is a constant. What we need to deal with is challenges of the industry when it comes to regulations like homologation. How do you right. ensure that a car is homologated to certain standards? How do you ensure the same thing with autonomous driving? How do you ensure the decision making that is done by an autonomous system in that particular moment has been, you know, is documented and you can refer yeah. to it? So we work, we have technical solutions for these challenges, but overall, to implement it in existing architectures is increasingly complex. And this is why it's important to understand if you want to continue with all these distributed ACUs and you slowly consolidate them, which many car makers are still taking an approach to move to domain controllers. So the cockpit domain controller, yeah, the body yeah. domain controller, yeah. it's a slow paced approach. And showing alternatives saying, can we go more aggressively about this? Yeah. Uh, an EE architecture today, every car maker that builds a new generation of electronics for a platform, it's gonna cost a billion dollars and more. It's a lot of money yeah. and it takes three to five years. So the question is, can this be expedited and can you move to a more rationalized platform that you're working on instead of you know just doing this evolutionary steps? The Chinese guys, um, all the OEMs in China, they have development cycles for these e-architectures that are closer to two years. So the likes of NEO and the likes of BYD, they're pulling off a generation in half of the time that traditional car makers are doing. You know, that's something to, to think about as an opportunity. And the analysis and the teardown that gives you options is actually, I believe, the right way to make transparency, put transparency out there for decision makers to understand what am I getting myself into? Yeah, yeah. Well, at the end of the day, uh, yeah. At the end, excuse me. At the end of the day, um, again, I go back to what's an engineer's job. An engineer's job is to come up with the best absolutely the best solution, the one that makes the most sense mathematically from a scientific standpoint, and then all the other things, weight, cost, all, the, all these other things. And in some cases, I think cost has been, uh, there is too many MBAs uh, in engineering. These people should be told that their job is not to be an accountant. Yep. Their job is to come up with the most effective, efficient, mathematically correct way to make things happen. And when you do that, you start looking more like a cell phone, not, not a compartmentalized bunch of characters trying to crank out something that at the end of the day has built in obsolescence. And I'm not really into that. No, so I agree the, the bean counter department that we see on the, the procurement department is often in the way of making systems decision. Engineers would advocate systems yeah. decision that are in favor of this growth and continuous change. But ultimately, it's the it's the structures, it's the governance model of procuring and and managing finances yeah. that actually contradicts this. So, well, the other thing is the standards. Standards hang around for too long. Oh, the uh, you know we were I was just talking to Michael Litke here a bit ago, talking about the problem associated with aircraft. Those those aircraft notes were made after the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, why are we still looking at these things? Why are we still making decisions the way we are? Things have moved on. Standards have to be identified. Yeah. They have to be qualified. And in some cases, they have to be ditched. And you're going to find at the end of the day that if we have 100% of all these standards, my guess is you're going to wind up with probably about 30% at the most. 
So let me give you an amazing example from one industry. You, you were aware of the push that came in the US against Chinese supplier for telecommunication equipment. Right, yeah. So I don't want to call out the names, but we know all the which, which, brands, uh, which brands are being referred to. And when, when these Chinese suppliers were pushed out, there was a big uh, challenge for operators, the likes of Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, because these Chinese suppliers offered their product at a fraction of the cost of established suppliers. Right. Yeah. So how, how do you cope with the sudden increase of your cost if you were only dealing with the remaining suppliers. So in that in that situation, one initiative took extremely fast off in that industry. It started around 2018. It was uh, it was uh, backed by Facebook's uh, connectivity um, department. It's called the Telecom Infrastructure Project, where operators gathered in one program and said, this is my requirements for software that runs a telecommunications network, a mobile cell tower, the core network for 4G and 5G. And the industry responded to this was actually working products within a year's time frame. So a year later, 2019, pilots were starting and you see the results here in the US with Dish Networks rolling out a countrywide mobile networks of the latest standards. Their network is just software running on top of standard Dell and HP and of the mill industry servers, the likes of that we all can buy for our enterprise data centers. Yeah. In the days before, you had to buy specialized telecom equipment, highly optimized with special right. ASICs and, and uh, types of hardware architectures. Yeah. So that industry has benefited. And the cost of that, it's just software. At the end of the day, um, you know, the cost of software helped to offset the miss of these suppliers that were government backed in China. Well, the big, uh, the big thing is, that, the biggest takeaway is that people only move when there's a gun to their head. Yep. And, um, and with that, uh, we're, uh, we're being uh, told to wrap it up. So, <laughs> so anyway, Thomas, thank you so much. Thank I you really, so much, really Andy. appreciate the uh, the time. This has been very interesting for me. We don't usually talk too much about no. software and how that uh, gets in uh, gets in the way of uh, of uh, or let me rephrase that how the mechanical stuff gets in the way yep. of, uh, of of making things better. So, anyway, I'd like to thank Thomas. I'd like to thank all you who are watched. Uh, this <laughs> this is a long one. But anyways, thank you for watching till the end and um, keep watching for more stuff here from the Consumer Electronics Show uh, down in Las Vegas. Thank you. Bye bye.